This video is brought to you by Squarespace. These are sickening scenes. <laughs> scenes of people looting, <laughs> vandalizing, <laughs> thieving, <laughs> robbing, and it has to be confronted and defeated. For five days straight in the summer of 2011, England turned into the purge. Innocent people are getting hurt. We all live in the same community. Why do we have to kill one another? That's off five generations, 1867 burnt to pieces. This was an insane time to live through where social tensions had bubbled up to such a point that it would result in the biggest riots in modern British history. And it has spread for three days running. London's burning and no one seems able to bring it under control. The violence. This laugh is going to kill people. Using. On the 4th of August 2011 at 8.18 p.m., The Telegraph posted one of the earliest reports of an incident. And in the article, the very first sentence reads as this. A policeman's life was saved by his radio last night after gunman Mark Duggan opened fire on him and the bullet hit the device. So this was one of the first reportings where the information had come from the police force. And the police sources also said that Mark Duggan, who was now dead, was a well-known gangster who had been under surveillance by officers. The man, 29-year-old Mark Duggan, was cornered following a surveillance operation. According to some witnesses, he refused to give himself up. It seems he shot a policeman before he himself was gunned down. The information that you are hearing at the time was being presented as fact. However, the truth is the situation was still being investigated. They didn't know that this is what had happened. This is just what the police decided to tell everyone. But it is important over the coming hours and days, I think, to allow people's fears and to ensure that rumours don't start up unnecessarily. Despite the MP's warning, rumours very quickly started to circulate about this scenario. Mark's children don't know that he's gone. We can't tell them yet because they're going to be asking questions. We don't have the answers to it. So just to put you in the shoes of the local community, imagine this is a tight-knit community. They all know each other. They've grown up with Mark. They know what he's like. And they were a bit dubious about the story that the police were telling them. They're portraying Mark to be a gangster. Mark is not a gangster. He's not known to any gangsters or any gangs. He's not like that. Mainly because the police weren't really communicating very clearly with them about exactly what had happened. And you were having bystanders and witnesses in the local town saying conflicting things. Some people saying that he was shot whilst he was on the floor. Some saying that he had a gun in his hand. Some saying he didn't have a gun. Some people saying that he shot at the police officer. And other people saying that he tried to run away. If he did have a gun, which I don't know, if he did, Mark would run. Mark is a runner. He would run rather than firing. Understandably, you would hope that the police would sit you down and say, this is what happened. But they didn't do that. They wanted answers from the police in terms of what happened to Mark Duggan. And one of the other concerns is they wanted a more senior officer to actually convey those messages to them. Two days after the shooting, 300 people from the local community gather outside of Tottenham Police Station and have a peaceful protest. This is confirmed. It was peaceful. They were just there trying to ask for a senior police officer to come and speak to them and explain the scenario. But the senior officer wasn't available to talk. At 8pm, shit absolutely hits the fan. Bottles, missiles, fucking leftover food was being thrown at the police officers. Police cars were now being set on fire. And so this is where the rest of the UK hear about what's going on. And it was pretty fucking mental. One of the things, even all these years later, that's very hard to pinpoint is the exact moment it went from a peaceful protest into a full-scale riot. There was this video that was posted on the 7th of August where we can hear an old lady, an older lady of the community, shouting... It's a gun! And very quickly, there was this initial rumor that was spread that the police had attacked a 16-year-old girl who was peacefully protesting. So again, just imagine the mood of the community where now they think a 16-year-old girl was being beaten by the police. They're already pissed off, and that's just made their day a little bit worse. However, this claim is, at best, 
a little bit wobbly. No individual, no witnesses, no one has ever come forward to the police and said, I am the 16 year old girl, or this was the 16 year old girl who was attacked by the police. This alleged woman was never identified. But on top of that, the fact of the matter is that the first police car that was set on fire was reported to have happened at 8.30. Now bear in mind, this took place in August. This is British summertime. Therefore, 8.30 would still have daylight. It would be light. But in the video, we can see that this is at nighttime. So, you know, it just, it didn't add up. But that did not matter because we're in a new era now. This is 2011. You got the internet. You know, information travels fast. You don't need to send out a pigeon to the neighboring town anymore. You could just film something on your phone camera and upload it very quickly to Twitter. And this touches on a wider part as to why these riots got out of hand in the first place. And there was one very important piece of technology that was the main accelerator of the London riots that allowed rumors and different stories to spread in a matter of seconds. I'm on a Blackberry hype. Some of you think I'm on a Blackberry hype. Bearing in mind that Blackberries were designed for like, you know, your corporate business boys. But for some reason, 15 year old boys outside of a McDonald's also needed a BlackBerry. What it was, was that BlackBerry had a thing called BBM, BBM Messenger. Sending a message on your phone back then used to cost like 10p a message. So if a heated banter exchange is popping off with the boys in the group chat, that might run you a tenner. But on top of all that, it was encrypted. Meaning rioters on the move are able to pick up messages about planned looting and police movements without law enforcers knowing it. And BBM had another feature that was very important in the London riots, and that was the ability to send out broadcasts, aka pings. This is where you could broadcast a message to everyone in your contact list. And so the people who had started rioting in Tottenham took to BBM and started broadcasting what was going on and where it was going on. The Guardian reports some of the BBM messages, some of the broadcasts that they were able to get hold of. Stuff like this. Fuck the feds here. Bring your ballies and your bags, trolleys, cars, vans, hammers, the lot. Apparently Apparently over BBM, people were, were broadcasting the sale of five pound riot kits. We got gloves, masks, petrol bombs, five pound a lot. I don't want to say it, but it's a pretty reasonable price. Before we go any further with this video, I want to give a massive shout out to today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is just the best platform for making a website. You need a good looking website these days. If your website sucks, you're probably turning away so many customers. And it can be daunting trying to make your own website, but Squarespace takes this whole process and makes it so easy and actually enjoyable. It's an intuitive platform with tons of templates. You can just pick and perfectly customize it to fit exactly what you do. If you're, you know, like a graphic designer, like a self-employed person, and you want to try and elevate your portfolio, or you want to directly sell via Squarespace, you can do everything under one roof. With all the built-in tools like e-commerce, email marketing, appointment scheduling, it's the perfect tool to just bring your business to that next level. If you've been thinking about making a website, I would definitely recommend using Squarespace. It's genuinely a great product. So be sure to check out squarespace.com forward slash Jimmy the Giant and to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, use the code Jimmy the Giant. Anyway, back to the video. By 10.45, violence was growing on the first night of these riots. And now the fires were starting to spread. These two fires I'm about to mention are very important in terms of like symbolism and how they were viewed in the media. Firstly, you had the old carpet shop. It was built in the 1930s and it was a listed building. That's because it's old and it was important. Half of the reason being that it survived the blitz. In local history, this building came to represent resilience. And so when this was burnt down by these young rioters. When the rest of Britain saw this in the television and the media, it was felt as a deep disrespect against British heritage. Secondly, you have the London bus. To me, this photo is one of the most powerful images from the London riots. When people picture a London bus, you expect to see old Duke Dickington the third jumping off and tipping his top hat to the driver. You don't expect to see it on fire with a group of ballied up chavs in front of it. As this image got broadcast around the world, it showed a very different Britain that doesn't get a lot of publicity. This is the side of Britain that we often keep a big secret. We sweep it all away in poor, underdeveloped, underfunded, undersupported communities, and we just hope that they don't complain too much. However, now, they had a voice and the whole world was listening. The Chav. We have to remember this took place in 2011. This was like the height of the Chav era. I made a whole entire video on Chav culture, which I can link below, but effectively what it was, was an underclass of people. Like our boy here, Crazy Steves. So that we don't forget about this important character in British society, I made Crazy Steves. You can see here with his designer hat, 
his little Siggy, his bottle of beer, his sporty tracksuit. The Chavs and later sort of road man, road culture was really this underclass that society really pushed to the side and absolutely hated. I'm just doing mad thing, bruv. It's Pete. These men don't respect me. Side note, you can pick these up. It's only out for one month, so I'll link it below. They make a great gift. I'm really proud of this. And if you do buy one, it massively helps the channel. So I appreciate it. That aside, Crazy Steve's represents like the underclass of this era that were always blamed and always had fingers pointed them for everything. No one really thought to wonder why people were living in these situations, acting the way they did. They just assumed that there were bad people and it was like a cultural problem. And so very quickly in the news, these riots were being reported in a very specific way. These people were being represented as just a nihilistic, rebellious youth who would take part in senseless criminality and were just burning their communities to the ground for no other reason than that they were bored. And so as the first night of these riots drew to a close, the entire country's attitude towards the rioters was that of disgust. A very bad night. Um, you know, I'm devastated, really, to see um, uh, a place that I grew up in and loved, Tottenham, Harringate, you know, um, looking like a, a battlefield. The next morning, the nation woke up in shock. We were now getting reports of the aftermath of the riots. Entire buildings had been burnt to the ground. 26 policemen were injured. 55 arrests were made. Cars were set on fire and shops were being looted however it was over you know we took a sigh of relief the rioters the police the rest of the country held hands and all came back together it was all over if you enjoyed this video be sure to join the dislike by 6 28 pm a little north of tottenham where it all started now in enfield there were reports that shops had been smashed in and that a police vehicle had been damaged but then something very weird happened. Minutes later, reports that on the south side of London, like quite far away from Tottenham and Enfield, all the way over in Brixton, a separate riot had started. And then a few hours later at 10.30, reports that a mob of 50 people had arrived in Oxford Circus in London's West End. Now it was getting serious. People were worried. These copycat riots were popping up in various parts of London. And all the while that that was happening, a very important piece of news News was reported by The Guardian. Channel 4 News has learned that the bullet that killed Mark Duggan and the bullet that lodged in an officer's radio were both fired by police. Now you see, this bit of news was a bit of a problem. If we go back to the first reportings after Mark Duggan was killed, it was sort of implied that he shot some police officers and that he was a gangster. And this certainly shaped the wider public's opinion on both Mark Duggan and the rioters. But when it turned out that the police officer was the person who shot the other police officer and Mark Duggan hadn't shot anyone, things became a little bit awkward. Between what happened in Tottenham and what happened in Croydon, there is no connection. What they did was pure greed. That's what made me angry. Like, people are like animals, like the real animals within people's show that night. Now it's the 8th of August, the riots are still going on, but now a lot bigger. The police are completely losing control of London. They were leaving large areas of London unprotected. The rioters just had free reign over the shops. They were looting everything. Locals were understandably terrified. This photo became the core image of what was happening in London, and it spread around the world. And now riots were popping up all around London. Enfield, Brixton, Walthamstow, Hackney, Peckham, Lewisham, Croydon, Clapham, Ealing. And then somehow something even crazier happened. To Britain where violence and looting that started in one London neighborhood over the weekend spread to three other cities last night. It is Britain's worst rioting in 25 years. 128 miles north of London lies a town called Nottingham. Completely separate to London, no connection here. Mark Duggan didn't have extended family up there as far as I'm aware. Now, Riots were popping up there. A police station has been petrol bombed and dozens of homes, shops and cars were attacked as youths went on the rampage in Nottingham early this morning. It's got out of hand, but it's gone way past. It's not connected to this anymore. We're not condoning any kind of actions like that at all to be shown or, or for this to be taken in my brother's name. On the same day, in just beautifully perverted irony, the politicians of Great Britain were having a nice summer break. The PM of the time, David Cameron, as well as Boris Johnson, who was the mayor of London at the time, and then Ed Miliband, who was the leader of Labour, they had to get out of the sun lounger, hop on a plane and cut their holidays short. 
And this was the scene in Birmingham tonight as the violence spread outside the capital for the first time since the trouble erupted on Saturday. But then it gets worse. Liverpool, Manchester, West Bromwich, Wolverhampton, Bristol, all of these towns all around England were now reporting that they had experienced rioting. And the police were failing. The local people had to go out and defend their communities, fight off the, the rioters. Because people, people are just waiting, they, they protect themselves, you know, because they can't do nothing, police, they can't do nothing. I remember just this, like, palpable fear across England at the time. It was it's vivid, I, I can recall it. The fear was that your town might be next. I lived near Luton at the time, so just... Imagine how I felt. There was a part of me that was thinking, you know, maybe a few fires and some of the ugly buildings might, might actually do the place a bit of good. But genuinely, for this week in England, it felt like our country was about to collapse. But then, reports of deaths started to occur. Let's get back to those events uh, in Birmingham. Uh, three men died after being hit by a car, believed to have been uh, protecting premises during the uh, night of uh, violence and looting in Birmingham. A man by the name of Tariq Jahan, whose son and his friends died whilst trying to defend their own community from rioters. He went on the news and talked against the rioters, but he, he did something very important. Instead of calling for revenge, he asked people to calm down and go home. We all live in the same community. Why do we have to kill one another? What started these riots? And what's escalating? Why are we doing this? Honestly, this video is heartbreaking and I don't want to go into too many of the stories of all the people that died because it is sad for sure. And in the video of Tariq, you can see him arguing as an elder of his own community against some of the young lads in his own community who were probably out rioting the night before. Good morning, my son. And you like starting up again? Why? Grow up, guys. Grow up. What we have seen on the streets of London and in other cities across our country is completely unacceptable. It is criminality, pure and simple, and there is absolutely no excuse for it. We need to show the world, which has looked on, frankly appalled, that the perpetrators of the violence we've seen on our streets are not in any way representative of our country, nor of our young people. The fight back has well and truly begun. David Cameron and the government had to do something, obviously. So they put 16,000 police officers in London. And it seems like this, in part, led to the beginning of the end of the rioting. The more and more police that were there, it was just a higher risk that you could get caught. All of the, the good shops had been <laughs> looted by now, so there was kind of less opportunity to you know, get your PlayStations or whatever. And as well, there was reports that some rioters were actually just feeling remorseful. Maybe they sobered up from the rage of the whole moment and saw these stories of people dying, saw what they had done to their own communities and eventually on the 11th of august 2011 the london riots came to an end fallout continues in britain over the rioting and violence that broke out one week ago today it began in london and spread around england for four nights at least five people were killed and many businesses were looted or torched the mopping up operation continues but this was a big mess and there's a lot to mop up it's believed that 20,000 rioters took to the streets across the country over 85 different locations. There was five deaths, many people were injured, $500 million worth of damage was done to shops and businesses, and then the invaluable stuff like just history and beautiful architecture destroyed. A very embarrassed British establishment sought to hand out the harshest possible punishments for rioters. There was 2,158 convictions with one 1,800 years total being given out. You were having people who had never committed crimes before, like first-time offenders, in one instance being given six months for stealing a £3.50 bottle of water from Lidl. I hope for their sake it was a San Pellegrino at least. 2,000 of the people being sentenced were on average facing jail time that was four and a half times as long as what would normally be warranted for the same crimes. But you see, as all this was going on, all this mayhem and the carnage, the aftermath, the country realised it had forgotten someone. What was his name? Was it Mark Duggan, was it? It is important, however, that I address some of the misinformation circling around much of which is unhelpful and some of which is inflammatory. Speculation that Mark Duggan was assassinated in an execution style involving a number of shots 
to the head are categorically untrue. Mark Duggan has been dubbed like the British George Floyd before. However, the scenarios are considerably different. George Floyd, it was pretty cut and dry what had happened. We could see it on video. But the Mark Duggan scenario was considerably more messy. In 2020, so nine years after the incident, forensic architecture did a report, did a, did a study with the Duggan family to try and work out exactly what had happened that caused Mark Duggan's death. I'll link the video below. It's really worth watching. It's very interesting. There's a few very important contentions in the story of how Mark Duggan died that I'll try and explain to you now. The officer that killed Mark Duggan is known only as V53. When he explained what happened, he said he was sure that he saw Mark Duggan holding a gun. He said it was in a sock in his hand and that he went to aim it at the police officer and therefore he shot him. However, when he dropped to the floor, dead, somehow the gun had vanished. Despite, on the record, not a single one of the officers reported seeing Mark Duggan throw a gun or anything like that, they later found a gun wrapped in a black sock 20 feet away from Mark Duggan's body on the other side of the railings, like on some grass. Forensic architecture who did the report, they played all the different scenarios in which it would be possible for Mark Duggan to throw a gun. And the way that they present it appears is that it kind of seems impossible and they allude to the possibility that the police could have placed it there. In 2014, there was an inquest into Mark Duggan's death and the inquest jury found that Mark Duggan was not holding a gun when he was shot. However, they concluded that the killing of Mark Duggan was lawful. Mark Duggan's family then challenged the decision, but they were ruled against and the UK Supreme Court declined to hear the case. But then jump forward to 2019. Reports would emerge that the Duggan family had settled damages with the Met Police, where importantly, they claimed that there was no admission of guilt that they killed Mark Duggan unlawfully. But privately, they settled with the Duggan family. The Metropolitan Police has apologised to the family of Mark Duggan, whose death triggered the riots in Tottenham, which spread throughout the capital and to other parts of the country. Officers have been strongly criticised by the police watchdog, the IPCC, for failing to inform his parents that they had shot Mr Duggan dead. We can speculate on whether the police were right or what happened in that scenario, but one thing we can say was that the police and the media's handling of this situation was extremely unprofessional. Since the riots, the, the media have been widely criticised for this. The IPCC had to formally apologise for handing out misinformation to journalists in regards to saying that there had been a shootout between Mark Duggan and police officers. Pretty much in unison, the media just concluded Mark Duggan was a gangster. They drove this narrative years after the whole riots, everything, with the Independent here calling Mark Duggan among Europe's most feared and violent criminals. However, the police task force, like the operation who were responsible for killing Mark Duggan, they came out saying that that was untrue. And then there's this image, this famous image where it shows Mark Duggan looking sinister and scary. This was all across the media when talking about Mark Duggan. However, it turns out that this image was cropped. And if you zoom out, it was actually a photograph of him mourning the death of his daughter. There's a really great piece by the IRR called Framing the Death of Mark Duggan. And it goes into the way that the media had shaped a narrative around Mark Duggan, where it was very very clear that they had this sort of guilty until proven innocent attitude. They decided what Mark Duggan was. They had made up their minds and that's how they presented him. And of course, the, the elephant in the room here is that a lot of this happened in black communities. And this definitely affected the rhetoric around the riots. Famously, this historian called David Larkey went on the BBC saying the phrase, the whites have become black. What's happened is that a substantial section of the chads that you wrote about have become black. The whites have become black. A particular sort of violent, destructive, nihilistic, gangster culture has become the fashion. And black and white, boy and girl, operate in this language together. This language which is wholly false, which is a Jamaican patois that's been intruded in England. After a weekend of destruction, looting and arson across London, questions are being asked about the root causes behind the violence. Many far more sophisticated minds than I have theorised why Britain nearly collapsed in 2011. And there's a few like main theories. So The Week posted this list of five. I'm going to go through them. Firstly is the police response. The police response was terrible. They didn't speak to the Mark Duggan family quick. And on top of this, the early police response to the riots 
were not great. Maybe this had something to do with the fact that there was major cuts to the police force, but who knows? Secondly was racial profiling. It didn't really matter about the specific events that happened. It was often seen as an expression of a feeling in the black community. Lots of the writers when interviewed would say that they felt they were a victim to racial profiling, that they couldn't walk down the street without having a police officer either drive slowly past them or search them for a weapon or something. And this leads us on to thirdly, social and economic inequality. The UK went through some brutal cuts to like social services, things for the youth to do. And there was major inequality from the richest of society to the poorest of society. And then we have the fourth thing, which is high unemployment. We were experiencing some major unemployment. Most of the people looting and vandalizing were under the age of 20 without any jobs. And so all these things lay the foundation for the fifth and final thing, which is mob mentality and opportunism. For sure, you can be sympathetic of the feelings that would lead people to rioting. But once it started, there were a lot of people that saw it as an opportunity to get a new pair of Air Force Ones or some Paul's Boutique for your missus. It doesn't make it right. And for sure, these people were responsible for their own individual actions. But to me, it just seems so dumb to look at it as a surface level thing. It's like, oh, they're just criminals. They're just bad people. And to not consider the reason why an individual would be okay with burning down their entire community, willing to potentially go to jail for a PlayStation but you do have to consider the fact that you wouldn't see, you know, a whole wave of middle class people out in the streets rioting and looting shops. You, that isn't probably going to happen. Riots tend to very often come from areas of high unemployment and where you have a massive underclass of society who feel no real way of achieving anything in their lives, who get constantly looked down upon and constantly seen as the blight of society. When you literally have this person who's well-spoken and supposedly a historian going on the BBC and claiming that all of this came from the fact that there were white people wanting to be black. Like this is a historian who should know that riots have occurred throughout history when you have tons of inequality and tons of unemployment. But somehow this scenario is completely different and it's because of Jamaican Patois. I've just been rereading Enoch Powell. His prophecy was absolutely right. The timing of the riots was very particular. It was 2011. Bearing in mind, a few years prior to this, the world had just witnessed bankers crash the global economy that did immeasurable damage to the world and like mostly went unpunished and got bonuses. 2011 was also just after the big MP expenses scandal, where instead of MPs smashing into curries to grab a plasma TV, they just took the money from the taxpayer. These MPs were handed out minimal punishments and just asked to pay the money back. And then you get this, sorry lady, getting six months for a bottle of water. And look, I just want to conclude with this. I am no way defending the actions of rioters. It was horrific and rest in peace to the people who died and it's fucked up. But I just think as a society in Britain, if we just always dig our head in the sands whenever something like this happens, until we take responsibility that our society and culture breeds this environment where people are willing to burn down their homes, these problems are not going to go away. If you're oppressing the, the, oppressing the people, oppressing the people, oppressing the people, eventually they're going to want to stand up to you because they're looking like, you know what, we ain't got nothing to lose. That's how I feel. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to join the Discord. We chat about all these topics. You can suggest videos, etc. I'll link that in the description. Also check the links for Crazy Steve's. I'd really appreciate that. Make sure you subscribe. Catch you in the next one. Peace.